So the understandably unfortunate news uh, being that the PlayStation 5 event that we were all excited for last week has been officially postponed. Um, Sony tweeted before we went live that their June 4th event has been postponed. We'll obviously update everyone on when they will reschedule, but it's the right move from Sony. People seem to be very happy about it. Um, we were very excited to see what play, what the PS5 news is going to be, but there are more important things right now, so good on Sony. Yeah, it does feel odd right now celebrating anything. I mean, even like today being my birthday, it's weird. It's like, it's like <laughs> yay, but there's bigger right. things outside. It's just that weird factor that I do understand Sony's, you know, stance on this and I support them for that. I think it was great. I love what they said at the end that more important voices need to be heard. So thank you, Mick. Uh, so yeah. I agree. Um, but to get into news that we do have is some Valorant news and that, that Valorant's first new agent will be Reyna. So we knew that there was going to be this other agent joining the crew, and this is what we've learned as Reyna will be the first new agent released in Valorant after the game's closed beta. The new agent who's set to come out sometime around the game's June 2nd launch right around the corner is an offensive powerhouse that's all about kill or be killed. Riot revealed Reyna with a teaser trailer on Twitter. The trailer itself didn't explain her individual abilities, but it did show enough of them for players to get an idea of how she works. Valorant lead character designer Ryan Morello Scott also chimed in on Twitter to give a clear picture of our Latina queen, as Coombe says. So while an official list of abilities has yet to be confirmed, several Riot Games staff members shared more details on the character, and Morello also made his contribution earlier today. That quote, Reyna has the potential to pop off like no one else, avoiding being traded on or healing, so you have to beat her square up each time, he wrote. If she doesn't get kills, though, she's bad, like near useless. You're making a big bet picking Reyna. And Reyna seems to be the ultimate snowballing agent. Morello revealed that she has to kill opponents to get stronger by getting their soul orbs used to get two of her abilities. And assists don't count. When picking a soul orb, she can choose an ability that fully heals her and even stacks up to 50 points of armor when she's at full health, or another which makes her invulnerable but unable to shoot for a short time. And both abilities share the same cooldown and can be only used in a short range of time. They can't be saved for another round, for example, but must be bought back like the other abilities. She only has a few seconds to pick up the soul orbs before they disappear, Morello added. What's up, K-Guardian? What's up? Killing opponents also resets her ultimate, which can be activated to enhance her soul orb skills and reduce her firing rate, reload, and recoil. It can make her deadly depending on how much her ultimate reduces those rates. No further details were given on her blinding ability, however, its range and duration are notably unknown. Many players shared their concerns on her abilities, which look very strong. According to Morello, she's the strongest, but also the riskiest duelist against uh, uh, agent to actually pick over uh, Phoenix, Jet, and Rays. Going even with Reyna is a liability, he wrote. I'm a big fan of her. I really like her her theme. Her voice lines are great. I think that it's interesting that she's very um, feast or famine, as how they've described her, where you're either going to be so OP, you're going to carry your entire team, or you're going to be incredibly useless. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a feeling I have here for those, like, really good players who are just super naturally gifted at shooters and gaming that this is a character that are probably they're probably going to cause some problems and request some nerfs right. to it uh because as as with any like team-based game it shouldn't be just one person could be so you know critical to the win it should be a kind of like this healthy balance or at least a strong player uh uh has that i, I think I, I get the concern, and I am curious to see how someone like, you know, Shroud plays with Reyna and what that shows in the game if you do have players like this playing as his character. I could see people getting salty as well if they come across a good Reyna that just totally deletes them off the map each time. We're going to see a lot of tweets that are like, nerf Reyna, nerf Reyna. But when those players actually try to play as Reyna, I don't think that they'll think she needs to be nerfed. It's kind of one of those, like in League of Legends, if you see like a like a pretty normal character get banned everyone's like we know that you were just totally stomped by that character that's why you don't want to play against them um so yeah. i wonder how often people are going to use her i feel like a lot of phoenix mains 
um, could easily make the jump over to Reina and be very successful with her versus someone who's more of maybe a Sova, a Sova player or someone who's more in the support and vision kind of play style. Yeah. And I would be curious to how much the, because some of the stuff that we're, we're, we were reading was that there's a, uh, there's a downtime in between her actually being able to pull out a weapon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could know if Arena did just get a kill and she's grabbed the soul orb, you got to like attack her immediately. And that mm -hmm. might become a very successful and, you know, more well-spoken strategy for people who are like, yeah, if you see Arena in your lobby and she happens to get a kill, she's going to be vulnerable. So that's when you just like aggress the, the, the player. But at the same time, I'm kind of like with Ray's, I, I just the 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 ability is kind of just seeming like they just are in a different league odd for for these kind of choices which seems well balanced for the most part it seems very she seems very ability heavy um yeah. i could also see people kind of zoning her because her soul orbs do disappear after a few seconds so if yeah. you force her to stay away from the soul orbs then that's also you know making her weaker or yeah. not as, as useful. Um, I don't know if Valorant saw so many people just being so good at the shooter part that they're like, wait, but don't forget about the abilities though. We made them consumables, but we still want you to use them. I don't know, yeah. maybe that's that's part of the trend as well. That's a, that's actually a really good point there too because the abilities are really, I, I always looked at the abilities as kind of like with like, you know, a comparison of like Warzone, it's your choices you make on uh, your lethal equipment and your tactical equipment. It's like, which do you want to go in with and how do you want to mm -hmm. benefit your team while you're in that? And it's still a shooter first, where this character feels very much like ability first, whereas yes. Ray's felt ability first. Uh, and even so much so to, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, what's her name? The, the healer, her name skips my Sage? Head. Sage. It was a very much like abilities first type mm -hmm. character that they needed to find a balance and way to really make make that not the case and right now i do agree with you there there is a lot of like she is basically a, a ability primary and we'll be able to play her soon because valorant's first episode which is coming up is named ignition and ascent is confirmed as their next new map yeah so riot revealed the name ignition as well as the fact that the new map will be called ascent which is based in italy and was showcased during reina's teaser trailer over the weekend Riot is uh, remaining secretive on what the first season of content will actually include. We do know that new game modes will also be joining the game on launch, but it's not clear what those game modes will be. On top of all the new info, Riot has also confirmed the release time for the game, and it appears to be coming out at different times depending on your region. And Valorant devs also did an interview with ESPN today, and they did confirm there will be a battle pass for Valorant, and it will cost $10. It's a really interesting price for a battle pass what kind of seasonal content would you like to see from Valorant? uh definitely good skins good weapon wraps good skins um i feel like i could see like episode i'm trying to not say season exclusive because it seems like episode is the word they're really going with um like episode exclusive um gun buddies i think they're called or episode exclusive you know skins or wraps beyond that i'm not sure what else could really be added what do you think yeah. Hello, hello. hello. Um, yeah, I... I don't really use sprays. Yeah, I don't either. Even in even in Warzone, I barely ever touch that. And maybe when I'm in the gulag just wanting to spray somebody to be, you know, because I'm <laughs> bored waiting. Um, yeah, I agree with Coombs. New maps are definitely needed. Uh, I don't know. Other than maps, I feel like this is a game sort of kind of, you know, doing all the right things outside of that. So too, um, I mean, they already said that they're going to come out with a new game mode. We anticipate that hopefully it'll be like a faster game mode yeah. that might be a 15 minute game. Um, there was some uh, data mined on that content, but it's not confirmed yet. I think more game modes, more maps would be great. Um, I think more fun game modes in addition to, you know, unranked and ranked, which is already very serious. Yeah. Yeah, they're do they seem to be doing everything right. I also think it's so new that I don't think they need to have all this flashy stuff to encourage people to True. play the game. It seems like people just want to play it for what it is right now anyway. Um, there is something recently added to Warzone that I thought was really cool, which is uh, colored tracer rounds. So, like, you can fire bullets and they look purple. You can fire, fire oh, bullets cool. and they look green. Mm -hmm. So, adding stuff like that would be very believable in this world that they've created within Valorant. Definitely. Um, but yeah, I definitely I'm I'm with you there. Just 
more variety of skins i think would would help me too and um, yeah i don't know what kind of accessories you could add like i don't think they're going to change like the glove colors or or anything else oh yeah that could be cool too adding adding some color to the to the hands a little bit but then that that might add some issues i i, I don't know right? it's, i don't know it's i feel weird. like they're doing it's, it how right. many bugs can they open up with just <laughs> you know right, one change of like small. glove color I hope yeah. that the launch tomorrow is going to be a big deal. I think it is, but there was just so much hype around the beta that I don't know if that kind of stole a lot of the fanfare that was going to happen around the launch. I'm really hoping their servers are going to be able to handle it. I think they should be. Mm. I'm just, I'm real curious to see with enough people playing it, do does it live up to the claims that they have, you know, obviously put forward about why Valorant should be your top I wouldn't be surprised if there were some issues starting off, or at least for the first week, um, because for the beta, they seemed prepared. You know, they were dropping keys. They knew how many people to anticipate, and there are still um, some issues right out the gate. So yeah. I hope that won't happen, or at least I think it will be resolved within a few days. Yep. But our other, of course, big topic is that PlayStation leaks new Fortnite icon, and the map is looking flooded. I am really excited for this. So it looks like Fortnite players are heading underwater next season after PlayStation revealed a new icon for the game in the store earlier today. So the updated icon for Fortnite depicts the battle bus soaring over the map, which is covered by an ocean without any points of interest in sight. But there's a small island shown on the right side of the icon. Therefore, fans are concluding that the icon is previewing the upcoming season of Fortnite, which is rumored to flood the map. Epic Games has been teasing that the Fortnite map will eventually become flooded for some time. Earlier in May, fans discovered puddles scattered across the map, which foreshadowed the next water-themed season of Fortnite. But fans noticed that this small island shown in the preview could be the same one that's featured in the Desert Island Flare Fortnite short film, which was released on June 21st, 2019. In the video, the marooned Jonesy attempts to flag down the battle bus using a flare gun, but ends up destroying the bus and eliminating all players and earning the victory royale. Other fans have suggested that the island shares striking similarities to the one seen in the SpongeBob SquarePants theme song, but we don't think that there's going to be a crossover anytime soon. Although the theme for the next season hasn't been confirmed, it looks like we're heading underwater, and fans won't have to wait long since Fortnite Chapter 2 Season 3 is set to be released on June 11th after it was delayed last month. I'm personally really excited for this because I love boat games and sea games and my favorite part of the current season of Fortnite is I think the swimming and the fishing um, and being able to move around in boats so I'm really excited. It seems like we've been hinting at it because this current storm the agency challenge has you swim over underwater hatches and so it seems like maybe next season those hatches you know you'll be able to open them up and you'll be able to go into is it going to be kind of an underwater bunker? Like, are you going to move around the map with submarines? Like, how does swimming work? Is everything underwater? I feel like there are a lot of questions to answer, but I'm excited and I trust that they're going to do a great job of this. And I think we have to embrace the fact that if they do go fully underwater, where maybe there can be some stuff that starts above, but then going underwater, everybody's just, you know, you have unlimited oxygen. Uh, it's now become a zero grab shooter. It has. And that is something to me that I was like, oh, wow, I'm very interested. Is it that they, how do they, you know, make building work? It's, which is obviously a, a foundation of Fortnite is the ability to craft and build. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure, but I'm actually very interested to see how this plays out. Because if this is in that realm of gameplay, like it would interest me to play it because that ability to be in a zero grav is is just it's a totally new layer of of thinking it is and it's like the trendy thing to do right now there are a lot of games that are kind of zero grav style shooters or space shooters and this is fortnite's own way of also you know jumping on that train i'm imagining maybe some of it will be in actual underwater fights versus maybe yeah. structures that are also placed underwater i wonder how this is going to affect landing because if the map is going to look like what the, the PlayStation Store thumbnail is, then everyone just lands on the surface of the water. So right. I wonder what that's going to look like and how that's going to affect gameplay. Good good point there. There was a game uh, that's slipping my mind that is an underwater BR where you're all like scuba divers and there's also sharks and stuff that you have to worry about. 
and uh, uh, you are on the submarine and you're moving through the water and then it shoots you out like torpedoes and then you eventually just kind of like slow down in an area. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if maybe like, maybe that's what'll happen oh. is the, the balloon that moves the, the bus along will like detach and then the bus will like turn into a submarine that would be really and then it would cool. land in the water and then that's how people would disperse. That would be sick. I am psyched for this. I can't wait to see what will happen. They already have some cool skins in the Fortnite store that are already like scuba diver themed, underwater swimming themed. Um, And I hope that pros will be excited for this because I feel like pros are always angry no matter what happens in Fortnite. But uh, I would like to let the record show that I am looking forward to this. (laughs) Yeah. And if you think about it too, Fortnite in and its own way kind of needs to do something fresh and different as much as it's had these events and, 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 and had the attention that it's had and the new map or whatever kind of needs to do something a a little bit different to continue to draw people in. And this would be that great way of, of doing that because I would imagine if we think about the Travis Scott concert, there is a point where you're underwater and you're traveling around Mm -hmm. and there is a point where you're in space and you're traveling around. So don't be surprised if they start to play with the, you know, the area and setting that you're in where maybe the next one is they take you to space. And uh, this one is we stay in water. What's up, Belbo? What's up, Belbo? Um, I am always impressed with what, what Epic does. They always pull out all the stops. Um, that's true. Maybe this will be underwater. Maybe the next chapter is going to be space. I feel like Fortnite is really trying to push the envelope here. And even though all of these updates do entice me to someone who doesn't play Fortnite, like adding helicopters isn't going to make someone download this game. But maybe, as you said, having underwater play or having space play would bring in new people or returning players. Yeah. Well, uh, Bell Blow, Bell Blow, this is the Caffeine Channel News Hour. So currently we're going through news, but gameplay is coming up after we are done here. Absolutely. But for now, we're going to talk about how Call of Duty Modern Warfare Season 4 um, has and everything we know about it. Yeah. So Modern Warfare Season 4 is dropping soon. And following Infinity Wars trailers and detailed leaks shared by the community, we kind of have a good idea of what may be around the corner. New weapons and maps are almost certainly in the cards, but the real buzz is around the game's next operator, who is likely to be a fan favorite, Captain John Price. Trouble is brewing in Verdansk, and it feels, it appears that COD Modern Warfare Season 4 is about to dig deeper into the turmoil erupting across its landscape. You didn't say Verdansk. I didn't say Verdansk. Nice. So while we can glean plenty from Infinity Ward's heavy hints, there's also leaked information that may establish a clearer picture of what's to come. In other words, some of this information is not final and subject to change, but we'll be updating this article and information as official news comes to light. Anyway, with its release just days away, here's everything that we know about Call of Duty Modern Warfare Season 4. Call of Duty Modern Warfare Season 4 Weapons. Previous leaks have suggested that the Galil and Vector, referred to as the Fennec, could be the next guns joining COD Modern Warfare's arsenal, and the new story trailer gives us the briefest glimpse of them. And uh, you can actually use the the Galil. It's a random weapon drop in red chests, so that is definitely something I'm looking forward to getting more of. Uh, Redditor user Jean JWE posted a long list of news on weapons, operators, and maps mined from the most recent patch. This includes details on potential attachments for each new weapon, spanning stocks, barrels, and magazines. Other guns, including the Rytec AMR, G28, and AN94, also reportedly cropped up in the new code, as well as references to melee weapons such as Akimbo Blades and Akimbo Batons. Call of Duty Modern Warfare Season 4 Maps. Eagle-eyed fans will notice that the Season 4 heading at the end of Infinity Ward's latest trailer reveals a portion of the beloved Modern Warfare 2 multiplayer map, Scrapyard. This map already exists in Verdansk on the periphery of the Zokov Boneyard area, but its presence in the trailer suggests it could return in its multiplayer form. What's changing in Battle Royale? Well, we have duos which have launched for Warzone. We currently have a lot to choose from with a healthy Battle Royale playlist that spans solos, duos, trios, and quads, as well as plunder quads. 
New modes have also been outlined in Jean JWE's leak. Juggernaut, Jailbreak, and TDM Anywhere are highlighted as potential upcoming Warzone options. According to the report, Juggernaut will challenge teams to compete for special crates in Battle Royale. Jailbreak is rumored to redeploy players in the Gulag at specific times. TDM Anywhere has fewer details, but its name reveals that it's some form of deathmatch. And we already know that Warzone will connect to different COD series and previous leaks claims that Call of Duty is headed to the Cold War next. With the recent revelations in Warzone's bunkers and Activision blog post outlining the potential for global thermonuclear war, <laughs> if planned as to go, its extraction operation is compromised. It seems as though there are still some secrets to be unearthed in Infinity Wars free-to-play Battle Royale. One thing is for sure, Warzone isn't leaving us anytime soon, but we'll likely watch it evolve to welcome in another COD sub-franchise. Maroon, what do you think of all of these new things coming to Warzone, and do you think that Season 4 is going to live up to the hype? I I hope it does. You know, there is there is that kind of... I have reservations with Call of Duty and <laughs> with Infinity Ward and Activision, so, you know, I'm trying to manage my expectations. But I think this could be, this could be really big and continue to draw interest. But I do think... I, I do hope it's a map. Uh, that is uh, what is dropping this season because I think I think Warzone's kind of hitting a little bit of a ceiling with the same map experience over and over and over again. I think it's ultra, also interesting to see that some of these maps are coming to multiplayer mode, so they're also still continuing to push out content for that. Even though it seems like the focus is on Warzone and more people uh, have their attention on Warzone, um, they're still building up their multiplayer base there. I hope it's going to live up to the hype. I still think that season four is going to be a huge release. I think seemingly everyone is going to be playing it when it comes out and hopefully people don't burn out too quickly. Yeah, agreed. And for someone like myself, who is really unhappy with BR Trio's classic only showing up for three days, if there was anything that we could have be brought back, it would be that or some form of hardcore realism you know, one dead and you're, you know, one death and you're out with a team kind of uh, war zone experience would be great. I agree. What's up, Phoenix? I would love to see classic mode brought back. I think that is what would lead me to download Warzone as someone who doesn't really play Warzone. I was considering it yesterday. I was like, should I actually play Warzone? And then I was like, no, I don't want to deal with contracts. I don't want to deal with loadouts. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm not going to do it. If there's classic mode, I'm going to play it. When I talk about Warzone now, I've actually heard about more and more people uninstalling it completely, saying that the updates are just too big and they're kind of sick of them at this point and won't tolerate more updates, especially if they're, the files are so big and they take so long to download, which I was surprised to hear. I thought that the updates were seen as more annoying, but not a total deal breaker. Yeah, I also think that when you have a game that is this large and you have an influx of a player base that is this strong um something that we saw recently over the past like few days was the the cheaters resurgent has mm -hmm. really come back they again had an, yeah so as we're talking about war zone if you do play and you do just feel like hey that's suspect or wow i feel like i'm seeing a lot more aim bots and wall hacks and things like that uh, some message board reading was that there was an update for the hacker software that allowed them to get around the security that uh, they had put up for the game. So you're going to see more of that. Um, mm -hmm. And and ultimately, we've really got to figure out a way to to, to curb this. Like they've really got to find that answer to getting rid of the hackers and and actually doing something about it when people are getting reported. Because I don't know how many I've reported and recorded and not still been notified that this person has been been banned when it's happened. It's disappointing to hear that because of an update, the cheaters are back and the hackers are back. I wonder if uh, Infinity Ward is doing that thing we reported about the user who said, just look at people's KDAs. Like if their KDAs are five times the average of good players, like there's probably something wrong going on there. I don't know how effective um, that would be if um, put into action. I think it, I personally think that it probably would be very affected, effective, but um, I think that Infinity War does need to keep cheaters out of this game because it, it really ruins it for the people that are playing. It's already difficult to download this game. Um, it's a huge map. 
Um, apparently there's a lot of toxicity going on. One of my friends who's been playing Warzone was saying that his teammates were saying things that were just like beyond messed up. Like there's one yeah. level of like trolling and joking around, but like what they were saying was just like to the nth degree of like not cool to say online or at all to anyone in general. But they, they said that it does ruin the experience. Yeah, so hands down, the toxicity within this game is very much prevalent. And uh, yeah, like from usernames being usernames that it's like, why this should be banned? I don't know how mm -hmm. they got away with this username. Two, especially after you kill somebody, I've heard some things on that little split second of hearing the enemy that is just like, wow, this is such an odd re response to losing uh, <laughs> right now, but offensive, Com like just completely offensive. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that in season four, maybe the focus on the exciting guns or the things that are happening or this, yeah. what do you think of this new um, player, Captain Price, that they're adding to the game? Yeah, I think he's going to get a lot of use I mean, I think that we're going to see a lot of Captain Prices running around. I mean, he's an OG. If you think of Call of Duty Modern Warfare uh, 1, yeah, Price was huge. Like, I mean, I he's, a, he's a big, big character in, in the entire series. Um, but yeah, if, oh, that's a really interesting point. If game companies were serious about banning cheaters, they would succeed. That's true. You would see an influx of players go, uh, yeah, I'll play your game more knowing that people aren't going to be cheating and, and ruining the experience for me. That's actually a really good point. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Um, hopefully Warzone Season 4 will go, get off to a good start. I hope that I won't see as many glitches and as many hackers as we saw from this current season. Yeah. I hope that Warzone has learned a thing or two um, and is committed to making this a good experience for the people who actually want to play. Yeah. Lastly, I feel like we got to play something since we mentioned Price. Do you guys know that the guy who plays Captain Price is on Cameo? Do you guys know this? Oh, oh the wow, Cameo really? site where you can pay yes. for like a happy we, birthday or Someone whatever. apparently paid Captain Price to do a Cameo for Nate Shot. And oh. we, are about to, we are about to play that right now. That's hilarious. Timmy, Let's Timmy, Timmy. Ah, oh, and Tim Tatman. Hello, Price. Stop reading chat for a second, all right? We need to talk. Okay, dude. Been tracking you, bruv. <laughs> Some of your tactics are foobar, but I like it. <laughs> Every squad needs a wild card, even if their KD is a bit off. <laughs> hey, I'm talking to you. Can you focus for one second? What? I knew this was a mistake. <laughs> Bollocks. <sighs> Look, I'm dropping in behind enemy lines June 3rd for Dansk. Lad, I hope, I hope you got all that. All right? Bravo 6, out. <laughs> Dude! I looked away! They knew! Price knows, bro. That's why. June 3rd, AO is for Dansk. Whole damn city of for Dansk. I might have a spot for you on the squad. Just don't pull out anything wacky like you did in 2015. HBR, mate? Are you serious? We might need a few more to carry you with decisions like that. Have Scooter reach out. He's got my number. Price is got. <laughs> Great. Love the cool. effects. Also, if, it, if anyone did pick that up, that he's mentioning Scooter Braun, who is a co-owner of Hunter Thieves. He's calling, giving him, uh, basically That's trolling hilarious. him. So, um, I don't know how much price call uh, costs on Cameo, but we now we know <laughs> that you can now purchase a Cameo from Captain Price. I mean, that's the same as like getting uh, the Master Chief. Uh, voice guy as well. That's cool. Oh yeah, I, I love that. <laughs> I love how much they're, they're just into the, playing those yeah. characters even further. Totally into it. The whole message was so on brand. So, so yeah. memeable. So memeable. But jumping into some other news is something very interesting price wise as the HP Reverb G2 virtual, virtual reality headset will arrive this fall at $600. HP is unveiling the HP Reverb G2 virtual reality headset with high resolution specs the company hopes will attract new enterprise users and consumers. The company is launching the second generation VR headset in a partnership with both Microsoft and game company Valve. The headset will debut in the fall for $600. And the revolution, the resolution of this headset is 2160 by 2160 per eye, which should help with the visual realism of VR, said John Ludwig lead product manager for VR at HP in a press briefing. 
He said the Reverb G2, which uses lenses de designed by Valve, will have 2.5 times the resolution of the Oculus Rift headset, delivering sharper images that enhance the feeling of being transported to another reality. Ludwig said, quote, these are brand new panels, not the same panels the Reverb G1 used, and they come with some amazing improvements in immersiveness. The contrast and brightness are significantly on these brand new, are up significantly on these brand new panels. We've also reduced the persistence of the pixels, so with the contrast and brightness boost, you get a much better visual experience. With persistence, you get a more comfortable and fluid experience. And HP worked with Valve and Microsoft to enable integration across the Windows Mixed Reality and Steam VR platforms. The new, the new headset is a replacement for the HP Reverb G1, which launched in March 2019 for $600. The headset had visual flaws that made it feel like you were looking at the world through dirty goggles, but those issues aren't in the new headset, Ludwig said. Uh, Anu Hiranen, director of new product introduction at HP, in a press briefing said, quote, we at HP have been learning to adapt to this new normal. Now the virtual way is the only way for us all. So this new normal has really accelerated and expanded how and when we use VR at HP. There will be a huge population of people working, training, and learning from home. VR has the opportunity because of the pandemic as a Zoom video as Zoom video meetings lack immersive interaction according to HP and physical meetings aren't possible. In April, Steam VR saw nearly 1 million additional monthly connected headsets, tripling the previous largest monthly gain. HP believes that by 2021, 25% to 30% of the workforce will be working from home multiple days a week and searching for new ways to collaborate. HP kept features such as high-resolution LCDs in a lightweight design and a 114-degree field of view. It runs at 90 frames per second. And like other modern headsets, it has an inside-out tracking and four cameras on the headset itself to get rid of the need for external sensors. Windows Mixed Reality also enables 1.4 times more movement capture, maintaining six degrees of freedom without external sensors or lighthouses, Haranen said. HP designed it to be more comfortable. The headset has manual adjustments for your eye settings and a face mask cushion for better comfort. You can flip the face mask 90 degrees when moving back and forth from the virtual to the real world. And the headset also has better weight distribution and comfort for extended VR sessions. It connects to a PC via a single cable. So for virtual reality users, these specs will certainly help VR games look sharper on this new VR headset, but it seems like HP is more pushing it as a utility uh, and, and, and focusing on the utility aspect of the Reverb G2 as well. What do we think about VR headsets possibly becoming an, an essential part of remote work? I think it's a cool idea that I never really considered. I'm also wondering how exactly it would come into play. In the article, they talked about how in Zoom meetings, it's not immersive. You're in front of your computer, but I don't think I necessarily need to feel like I'm in the room with someone. Or if I do, like maybe that would be really cool and really nice. I don't know if that's worth spending $600 on of my own money or from a company's budget. So I'm more interested in how they think that these will actually be utilized. I also think it's, um, it's quite interesting that they're kind of marketing this towards companies versus just consumers. I initially right. thought when we talked about um, how HP was working with Valve, it was going to be kind of a more consumer, uh, more consumer friendly or budget friendly Valve index, but it seems like this is geared towards companies. Yeah, I would say I think this adds a layer to human interaction that we kind of need even if it's in a digital way to kind of feel like you're around the other person uh you know those kind of moments when you're not speaking but you can kind of see body language right. or interpret it or uh there i think there's more of a sense of like yeah we were actually together in physically in the digital space you know working on this this project together it's phoenix was saying it could be great for engineering i think there's a lot of possibilities here that we we haven't thought about how this will benefit a lot of um, and maybe even expedite projects that distance or continued social distancing and, you know, different practices in workplaces to, to ensure uh, our health and safety, that this will allow that um, sense of, you know, social interaction that we thrive off of to still be there. 
could definitely see this um, among being used among creatives or people, you know, maybe storyboarding or working on the environment for a video game. Like if you can actually, you know, draw in VR in the space and, you know, have your coworkers there to really map out a whole environment. I think could be very useful. Um, I'm I'm excited that there are great specs. It's double the specs of its previous machine, I believe, um, and the price isn't so outrageous as the Valve Index. Um, it seems like VR is starting to get to the point where you can get a really good machine and not spend you know four thousand dollars or something just to be the first person on board. Yeah, and the ninety frames as Coombs was putting out, it's it's pretty good. It's not top line right now because i think the valve index pushes 120 um you know it, obviously that's gonna have some issues uh, just that's what it is but something we've been seeing with the oculus quest is you can actually go in and increase your visual fidelity right now there are some different backdoor things that you can just go in and actually get into the coding of the headset adjust these numbers a little bit and your images will be crisper so nice. you know this is i think actually might be hp's if we think about what HP is actually perceived as in the, the technical world, they're very much a, a focus of, of more like business and commercial yes. technology. Mm -hmm. So this could be a push for them to do the integration of virtual reality within the commercial and business industry that they are well-respected in. That's true. When I think of HP, I think of my old massive boxy desktop computer that was just used for like Microsoft Word or like my printer right now is HP. It's very kind of office work. Um, it's it's nothing like gaming, like HP. Yeah. Like if HP has like gaming gear, I'm not they really do. interested. I'm sorry, it's right. not really on my radar um, as much. So I, I think you're right that HP is kind of, is, is positioned very well to have um, to introduce VR to more yeah. of the corporate world. I'm right there with you. I think that's a that's a place that it's kind of put itself in. I'm the same way when like looking for like a gaming laptop or in the market for one. I've seen that HP has them, but for me, I'm, just, I'm not going to spend on on the HP. I'll go with like an, <laughs> I'll go with like an Asus Tough mm -hmm. Gaming, uh, or or I'll look more into like MSI. I'll, I I won't. The, HP would be like it has to be a huge discount, but. Like Kika, she recently got an HP laptop for work and she loves it. And I mean, its purpose oh, wow. and focus is to be more of a, a tool to assist her to, to execute uh, for her business needs. And and, mm -hmm. and that's something that, that I think that HP has won over in many of its consumers. So yeah, this is just, I don't know, I think they're making the right choice. Do you think that people who weren't really interested in VR at the beginning or who were turned off to VR in the beginning could come around to it if it became an essential part of work life? Absolutely. I feel like the more people that get a chance to play VR or experience VR become more interested in seeing it kind of be more present mm -hmm. because they, the moment you get to use a VR headset and kind of like explore what's possible, there's, a, there's kind of like a shift in what your perspective of VR is when, from the outside looking in. When I think of um, a new technology being adopted, especially in the office, the first thing that comes to mind is Blackberries, where a lot of people were, it was um, it was business issued and everyone had a Blackberry and some people totally didn't need Blackberries, but it was kind of like the cool thing to do because it's like, oh, well, I have a whole keyboard for my emails. Yeah. And it was kind of just like the next, the next level of being accessible and, you know, being in the workplace. So I could kind of see something similar happening where if everyone's using a VR headset, like that's the thing to do now. Uh, yeah, it, Kai, it actually comes with this one that we're talking about here has cameras added onto the headset, very much the, the, the sensors on it. So you don't have to worry about needing uh, external sensors to, to monitor you while playing. This is a trend that I think needs to happen more because one of the big complaints about having a, a, a headset is like, well, I need the whole space. You know what I mean? Like I need like mm -hmm. a six by six space. And that's not true with the Oculus Quest. I've played in more of like a three by four and it's worked and I haven't hit anything and I've still had an amazing time. I think with this headset, I wonder how comfortable it will be. Um, I personally can only, I guess, tolerate wearing a headset for maybe 30 minutes at the most before I just want to rip it off because it's either too heavy and it like always leans forward and I'm constantly adjusting it yeah. or it's too tight on my face or, you know, sometimes it is kind of 
off-putting to be so closed off from the world around you. So sometimes when I'm playing a VR game, I'm like, there's nothing to check in my room, but I just feel like I should be aware of this space yeah. that I'm in. Um, so I wonder if there, there's a way to flip the face mask 90 degrees from moving to the virtual world to the real world. I think that does yeah. help. Um, I hope they have addressed kind of the, the comfort and how it does sit on your head. Yeah, there are some accessories that you can get that can help offset the weight, uh, which is really cool. I found a strap that goes across the Oculus Quest headset that basically helps remove the front load uh, because mm -hmm. the strap goes across the top of the head. Um, and then, you know, other additions. I think, I think that's really where, if we even look at this design, virtual reality uh, uh, engineers and, and, and creators are recognizing comfort is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. uh, as to Kamikaze's point about the, the, um, the motion sickness, a lot of that is tied to the quality of image and the, the motion blur and things that you just don't normally get amongst the disconnect of moving and not actually moving mm -hmm. it can trigger, you know, nausea and things like that. So they're slowly ironing these things out if we actually uh, look at, at the technology and how it's evolved. Now I'm imagining with flipping the goggles 90 degrees, it reminds me of like um, when you see like people working in a lab with their goggles or like their welding mask and flipping it back and forth. I could see yeah. that as being part of an, like it's an office tool um, and it is, you know, something yeah. you, can, you can use to, you know, get to the next level of work, but also not be removed from the environment that you're in. That's a, that's a great point. I'm excited to see the reviews when this headset comes out and if it actually lands and does well with, with consumers on a commercial, on, on a commercial market. Me too. I hope it is successful. So our last topic of today is an opinion piece. Um, the opinion piece states that we overestimate the value of the console exclusive. And this comes from Jeff Grubb of VentureBeat that many would consider a quote unquote hot take. Grubb penned an article for the site titled, We Overestimate the Value of Console Exclusives. So we're going to go through the main points that he's talked about and see if we all agree with his take and also talk about this from the perspective of PC gamers and we are PC gamers. First off, Grubb lays out the foundation by saying that it's not that console exclusives don't matter because they certainly do. And he also repeats this a lot of times in the article. It takes a long time to actually get to the meat of the article because of how many times he says, I'm not saying console exclusives don't matter. Um, because they certainly do, but instead that using the example of a PS4 owner who bought the console just to play exclusives like God of War and Spider-Man isn't ideal for Sony. So these are some of the points that he made as, as we jump in. Uh, he says, let's say you bought a PlayStation 4 for an exclusive first party Sony game. And those are the games that you primarily play and buy. That's a big win for Sony, right? Well, not really. He goes on to say that console customers are of little value to the manufacturers until they buy into the ecosystem. And buying in the ecosystem also goes by another name, engagement. How much time are people spending playing any games within the platform? That's what Microsoft and Sony care about. If you read through their quarterly reports, they don't talk about hardware sales. The focus is on total revenue from games and services. That's what matters. And he is not just talking about the current gen. His take on it is also relevant for the next gen consoles as most gamers decide which console will be the platform for them going forward. So pretty much it's not that you just buy the console, you buy the exclusive. That's not a win for Sony. They want you to actually be using that console all the time, playing all your games on that console, talking to your friends on that console, and really investing it, investing into it with your time and money. His next point is how video games are like sports. And for that, he says, sports are something we usually do together with friends and family. And it doesn't matter if it's the same 100-year-old game. It's fun because it's a way to socialize. Video games have similar elements. A lot of people return to Call of Duty night after night and year after year because that is where their friends are. Again, this is not a factor in why people subscribe to Netflix beyond maybe water cooler conversations at work. And continuing with that sports analogy, Grubb points to the, the book movie Moneyball as a possible window into the future of the gaming ecosystems. That, that story examined how the Oakland Athletics were able to compete with the richest teams in Major League Baseball by rethinking conventional wisdom of how to value players. Instead of buying, buying stars, the A's management focused on buying runs. Uh, he said, I'm suggesting something similar is true with video games. When Microsoft or Sony spend their money, they shouldn't just try to spend it on blockbuster games. They should spend their money to increase the engagement that actually contributes to the health of their platform. 
Grab points to games that are popular multiplayer games being the real game changers for the next generation with games like Apex Legends and Warzone possibly being valuable, possibly being more valuable than the first party exclusives. Again, because of the overall engagement. And he says, an exclusive may convince you to buy a certain system, but you aren't as valuable as a friend network that collectively purchases the same console because of a particular service. That being said, Grub fails to point out that the, ad the adoption of crossplay in these popular games, which gives the gamer that choice of what console to use and might not be dependent on what their friends are playing on. What's up, Mally bro? And What's he up? ends his opinion piece reiterating that content is still king. Wrapping, but by saying Microsoft has exclusives because it wants to bolster its Games Pass service. Exclusives are important, but their value is largely dependent on their impact on engagement. It's in a complementary relationship, and one feeds into the other. This relates on what we were kind of discussing last week, which is that Xbox is more focused on its subscription, whereas it seems Sony is more focused on the exclusives. And I think that there is a balance needed because exclusives draw people in, but you need the subscription to keep people there. Um, for these yeah. companies, it doesn't matter much if people just you know, buy a PlayStation, buy one game, and that's it. They want people to be using the console all the time um, and buying games uh, in an ongoing way. So I think a balance between both is needed. Yeah, you know, that's a really uh, strong observation there. I would also add to that, maybe this is where that relationship between Sony and Epic is building. If anything Epic Games has done well is the social interaction and engagement in their games, such as Fortnite, um, are very strong and they know mm -hmm. what they're doing and they have that data. It speaks volumes uh, to Grub's point here. And that may be something that we see going into the PlayStation 5 that, yeah, it'll have its exclusives, but its exclusives might come with a multiplayer aspect um, that is a free-to-play experience. And that will allow those friends to come and play together. So with this quote-unquote hot take, um, do you think that if true, it will certainly shake up the console market? But even as PC gamers, hasn't this been the case for almost a decade now? And does this just prove that consoles are becoming closer to what the PC master race is like? Absolutely. Uh, the consoles are, in fact, joining the PC master race <laughs> conversation because they and then of themselves, when you actually break down their, their hardware, you would be like, yeah, it's a gaming PC. I, I understand that. <laughs> um, and, and that's just where it's going. And the, the fact that, uh, um, uh, Tim Sweeney for Epic mentioned that these next gen consoles are going to have advantages that PCs won't have because they are, uh, made specifically for gaming, whereas PCs aren't made specifically for gaming. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have a lot of other applications and things and code that they're, they're built with. So there's an advantage there that I think consoles are going to find themselves uh, in especially these these next gen ones, and you know, I think this really is going to shake up how these major developers like Sony and Microsoft have to uh, design their games, or at least envision them. I think so too, because as it stands, I, when I was reading the article and they were talking about how they don't want people to just buy a PlayStation and play one game, I'm like, that's me. Or really, it's my friend bought a PlayStation just to play Red Dead Redemption, and then I'm borrowing that PlayStation to play The Last of Us. And it's totally, I feel like it's its not cheating the system. I mean, I can do that as a consumer, but it's definitely not what the goal of the company is. But that's exactly what I'm doing is only having this machine just for those exclusives, you know, not moving over to the PS4 or to the PS5, maybe like yeah. I'm predominantly going to be on PC because of the pre-existing things I already have on there. I have a Steam library, I have my Steam friends, you know, I use Discord when I play games and I've kind of bought into the PC world. Um, so I think that on console, they've kind of tried to move that way, um, including putting uh, streaming apps on consoles is a way to, you know, keep people using those machines as well. Um, when PlayStation let you play Blu-ray discs on it, I think was kind of, not, not exactly the same thing, but kind of the same trend of like, we want you to spend all your time on this one machine yep. versus spreading it out. Yeah, for sure. And looking at the hardware under the hood for these next gen consoles, you know, with RTX cards, kind of what we understand with graphics is there's not really another place to go graphically. Like we've, we've kind of hit a ceiling now it's how much information can you process at one time 
mm. so that the graphic experience, though it's hit its ceiling with global illumination and and uh, you know the the way that actual light, light actually behaves uh, within ray tracing, then it's features like the sound that we know is coming with the PlayStation Five, and then the the solid state, the speed that are happening with these solid state drives. I, I think. There's something to be said that if they choose not to go the route of like allowing you to upgrade their console, which no console's ever been able to do, mm -hmm. uh, the current hardware is still gonna the the next gen hardware is gonna stand strong for quite a while, um, and it will require like a new development in you know our CPUs to get us to a place to feel like oh PC Master Race is now you know the king. I agree. Um, when I got into PC gaming, everyone's saying how great it is because you can always upgrade your parts. And I'm like, okay, that's cool that I can upgrade my parts. But as you said, I'm not going to have 3D Tempest audio. I'm not going to have haptic feedback on my controllers. Like that's something exclusive to the PS5 and exclusive to some of these consoles that these machines can handle that just aren't built into what you can really do with PCs right now. Yeah. And that's a, that's a part I think for so long has been if we actually look at the numbers of just to say, use Warzone as an example, we were talking about it. Uh, the majority of people on that game are console players. You're talking probably, you know, 60 to 70%, if not more, are playing that game on console on PlayStation 4, on PlayStation 4 and, and, and Xbox One. And then you have the PC community there and, and, and as strong as they are. Um, there's an understanding there that as something that could be so popular the console games just have taken more of a, a of a a foundation within general gaming consumers. You mm -hmm. know, for you to get into PC gaming, you're understanding like I'm continually making an investment. I've got to change things up. I've always, I'm, you know, at some point I'm going to upgrade my motherboard. At some point I've got to upgrade my video card. At some point I've got to upgrade. When you buy this console, what they're saying to you is you're going to be good for like the next decade. And I think this next gen is really going to be like, yeah, you're really going to be good for the next decade when we right. actually look at the hardware. So has a certain console exclusive ever been the deciding factor for you uh, to purchase a specific console? Back in the day, yeah, with uh, ha yep, that, yeah, Halo for Xbox. It's the mm -hmm. only console exclusive where I was like, I have to buy this console in order to play this game. I will buy an Xbox. Yeah, when um, my my dad bought my family an Xbox, it was because of, you know, Halo, Halo 2. Um, I forgot what else we played besides, like, Max Payne and Splinter Cell. I don't know if they were exclusives at all. Uh, yeah. But um, those were, you know, that was what the Xbox was bought for. And even my friend had a PlayStation 2, and it's like, cool, I really like playing 007 Nightfire, but I don't feel like I need to buy a PlayStation 2, you know, just to buy you know, some of the titles that they played on there. Yeah. I think um, in recent memory, um, people, you know, buying PS4s, lots of exclusives, um, Final Fantasy VII, God of War, Red Dead Redemption 2, The Last of Us um, is a big reason to buy a PlayStation over the current yeah. Xboxes. With the next gen, um, I think Hellblade will be an Xbox exclusive, but yeah. the first Hellblade um, was released on PC, so yeah. I feel like I would just wait for it to come out on PC personally versus yeah. on Xbox. Yeah, I think we're going to see uh, a strong influx of, like, for example, there's this game coming out, it's like War Face or something like that, mm -hmm. and it's basically, it's a cross-play, but only between consoles, only between PlayStation 4 and, and, and Xbox. And there is a huge complaint, especially in games right now that have PC crossplay, that the majority of the hacking and cheating comes from PC players. But when you don't include PC players, it's a pretty good uh, through line of, of no cheating whatsoever. Wow. So that's something to to be said that, you know, jumping into these consoles might be the, the choice to make just to avoid having to get into lobbies like that and have to, you know, uh, you know interact with these these trolls that are there because on the console side, they're there, but the percentage of them are drastically different than what it is over on PC. That's so terrible to hear that it's like the solution kind of just sounds like we should be shutting out PC players. And as a PC player, I don't want that to happen, but I'm, I also do understand I wouldn't want cheating in my games either. You know, if I could play a game on a console to prevent cheating, like I probably would. I probably would like, you know, just figure it out on a controller, even though that's not, you know, the best mode of playing for me. Yeah. What's up, Nat? Hey, uh, so if you're watching a broadcast, you're not actually able to see who uh, the amount of people are in it. But if you are the broadcaster yourself, you can see it. 
Because at Caffeine, it's correct. not about the viewers, it's about the content. And we want to make sure that people are, what they're watching isn't based on the amount of people that are there, but they actually enjoy what it is they're watching. Exactly. I also think there are a lot of um, console exclusives that don't are, aren't really bringing me over. Like uh, Death Stranding, I believe, was a PlayStation exclusive. And I think it's out on PC now, or it's coming, coming out PC. on PC, yeah. coming to PC. Um, yeah. But there are a lot of exclusives where I'm just like, I don't even know if I want to play this at all. Or, you know, maybe I would like at a discount or on a friend's computer. Um, but I feel like with ex exclusives, a lot of these titles are generally good. But I, I, I do agree with this opinion that you can't um, bank your whole console yes. on just exclusives. Absolutely. And I, I would say with the success of these cross-play titles that recognize that, you know, free-to-play has its strength uh, and the ability to have all of these, um, you know, like they said, so many people jump on and play Warzone because that's what their friends are playing. So I know I can join mm -hmm. my friend and play, you know, Warzone with them. They'll be there. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to see, especially with how much money Activision just made off yes, of Warzone, just so off much. of the, 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 the billions it hit. Yeah, people are going to be like, you need to start making games that get people engaged to billions in months. Definitely. There is money in a lot of these free-to-play games. Um, and I do think the Battle Pass also you know, wraps people up in, in subscribing, literally, um, to some of this content and seeing on those kinds of platforms. Thank you, Phoenix. Have a good one. And that does bring us to the end of our Caffeine Channel News Hour for this Monday of I don't know what week that we're on for this caffeine 11? social distancing. I don't um, know. I don't know. Thank you so much for joining us. Sign up to con to join the conversation if you haven't already and click the star to get a notification each time we go live. Um, but don't go anywhere. No, because Zand is coming up with some gameplay and he is going to be holding it down, playing some Borderlands 3, as Evan is letting us know right there. But for Kaiza and I, we are out of here, and we will be back tomorrow. So if you want to tune in again for some more Caffeine Channel news, that'll be at 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, live here on the Caffeine Channel. But again, have fun with Zand. Thank you so much. Um, wish a happy birthday to Marone. Um, wish a happy birthday to Marone. Happy birthday, Marone! But I Thank am so Kaisa. I am Marone. You all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for the birthday wishes. And uh, you guys have fun with Zand. Bye.